When we open up a piece of software for processing an image, it can be really easy to become intimidated by it. And that goes for any of the applications out there. There's just a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of depth and features to this software. But the component that we're putting in, the capture, the image itself, usually isn't that complicated, especially for people like us, wildlife photographers or field photographers. Because if you think about it, we actually shoot in pretty much the same conditions a lot of the time. Now, if I'm going to use Africa as an example, which is where I am, if I think about the scenics of a shot that I put wildlife in, if I go out and I photograph a buffalo or I photograph a lion or something like that, invariably it's sitting in a particular kind of environmental scene. And what I'm talking about here is a colour. It's a colour scene. If we think about African landscapes and African environments, a lot of the time in my part of the world, we're talking about uh, browns, golds, greens and blues and shades in between that. You can put that line anywhere and it's going to be sitting in a scene that has those colours in it generally. It's not going to be sitting in a McDonald's with red and yellow and maybe some grey tile. It's sitting in the African bush. We can say that's generally true. And the same goes for the light, because we're outdoor photographers. We photograph a lot of the time in natural light. We're not adding uh, artificial lighting to the scene. There's no neon signs in the African bush, I think. So when we place that lion in that scene, that green and gold and blue scene with the sky as well, and then we place it in sunlight or in overcast, we can say that that sunlight or overcast has certain properties that is generally uniform. Now take this concept a little bit further, take it to your own area of the world. Perhaps you're shooting in the United Kingdom or Europe, you're shooting in a greener environment. You're shooting maybe with uh, patches of clouds and overcast, but generally that environment and, and the scene is not changing that much. It's predictable to some degree. You know you're out in a field, you know that it's 10 in the morning, you know that there's patchy overcast, and you therefore know the properties of that scene. And this really helps when we're developing a structured way to process photos in this kind of software that we're talking about because we know the characteristics of the image right away. Now the third part of this little pyramid is the exposure settings and these are up to us. We choose these when we take the image and we choose the settings our camera uses. If you think about that, you're choosing a global setting of how bright or dark the image is. You choose that. You choose that by changing the settings on your camera. You also choose the contrast in the image by deciding where to put the camera, which way to place the image, and to a certain extent by choosing exposures as well. If you place that animal with the sun behind it, it's going to be a high contrast scene with a silhouette. If you place that animal with the sun front lighting it, with the no shadows in the image effectively, or under an overcast sky, you're going to have a low contrast scene. So that is within your power. So if you think about those three components, you have a scenic, a scenic component of colour, to an extent contrast. You have a light component of colour. You have a exposure con uh, uh, contrast content as well. And you can add those together. Those are the things that make up your image. So when you take that image into a piece of software, those are the things that we're going to be controlling. And there's not that many of them. It actually isn't as complex as we think. Another concept that it's really worth getting your head around is the idea that contrast or brightnesses and darknesses and colors are related to each other. And the way they relate is through the luminance value of the color. Colors are generally described in software with a hue. Uh, you have a saturation change, how, how deep the color is, how, how much saturation is in that color. And it's important also to realize that color saturation is not uniform. Some colors can be more saturated than other colors to our eyes to human perception. And this is because humans can't see colors equally. We tend to see yellows more easily than we see blues. Whereas for a dog, it's the other way around. And this is the characteristic of our, our eyes. But then we have a luminance value. And luminance is where colors and brightness and darkness really 
meet and interact. You can describe the luminance value as either adding or removing black from that color. So we can think of exposure, stroke, contrast adjustments and color adjustments as two sides of the same coin. But there's a really important distinction to be made because some of the adjustments, I'm talking specifically about exposure here, are much more global. They affect the entire image. Whereas contrast adjustments affect portions of that image, the brighter or the darker areas. And then finally, if you make color adjustments to perhaps a single color or to a group of colors, that affects the smallest part of the image. So there's no sense in coming into Lightroom or another piece of software like it, diving straight into a color adjustment when you should be perhaps thinking that you need to adjust the global components first, exposure followed by contrast, then by tweaking colors and local areas of that image. And it should be no surprise when you look at the adjustments panel in a piece of software like Lightroom that it's arranged in exactly that order. A little less than a year ago, I started playing around with these topics in my head and trying to work on some way of structuring the adjustments in Lightroom and Photoshop to achieve a, an efficient and predictable way of working with an image. And I produced a video back then, which I'll link to here, which kind of described the initial concept that I had. But since then, I've worked a lot harder on it. And I've actually put together a course and something I call the Wildlife Toolkit to work through an image. And the way this is working is by taking those characteristics of outdoor photography. So this can apply to anything shot in natural light. and those characteristics of color and contrast that I've just described and putting them next to each other in a structured format. And this workflow takes you through the steps of image adjustments from beginning all the way to local adjustments at the end and therefore produces a very predictable set of outcomes and a very intuitive way of working with an image because you can hover over an item in this workflow and see the effect on the screen. Now, in addition to this, I've taken advantage of a feature of Lightroom and Camera Raw in Photoshop that allows us to create custom color profiles. And the idea behind a color profile is to exploit the characteristics of natural light. You may notice that when you take a picture in sunlight, the sunny areas of the image appear warmer and the shadowy areas of an image appear cooler. And that's generally true of any image shot in natural light, even shaded light. And the only thing that really changes is the intensity or the depth of the contrast between the brighter and darker shaded areas of the image. The color split between those, whether it's an orangey highlight or a very purple shadow or a yellowish highlight and a very blue shadow and exploiting that using a color profile to either emphasize or de-emphasize it gives us a really amazing degree of control over the processing of an image that isn't usually available to us because we normally just take the camera match profile or the adobe profile and apply it to the image. Using these custom profiles, we can really take advantage of color splits that we see in nature and apply them to our image. And there's a logic to it because a lot of these color splits uh, are arranged around times of day or conditions of light in the day. Let's talk about this process uh, and, and come to some kind of conclusion about the structure of a workflow. And I think the first thing we need to talk about is the understanding that the capture is actually part of the processing workflow. That's something that, that didn't occur to me for a long time, and I think it held back my photography, and most of you probably know this already, but sympathetically capturing an image or capturing an image in such a way that it aids in the processing of that image in the software is obviously going to give us far better results in the final image than uh, trying to make an image that wasn't captured in the right way 
consistent with some kind of vision that we apply to it in processing afterwards. We're gonna try and stretch that image into something that it wasn't to start with. And I think a lot of newer photographers try to do that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it really doesn't work and the image just looks awful. So once we get this image into our processing software, it then becomes important to understand the order of adjustments. And we've kind of gone through that already in this video. We're talking about global adjustments first because those global adjustments radically affect color. And if we make an, a color adjustment at the beginning of the process and then make a global adjustment, well, the color is going to change. The, heat, the properties of that color will change as a result of that global adjustment to exposure or contrast. And that's inefficient. It's better just to get that out of the way and then deal with the colors later. And that's kind of the upshot of this video, realizing that color and contrast color and exposure have a relationship. They're not independent. And it took me so many years to realize that I was a bit of an idiot. But now I do, it really has helped me with my processing. And I hope these concepts, if they're new to you, help you as well. I'll see you next time.